genome products of a protein, so they say, well, it's a nutrient, it must be safe, but no one tested it. So from 1948 to 1957, it was being added even to baby foods, because the baby food manufacturer said, oh, let's get the babies to eat, so we'll put it in the baby food. Well, then in 1957, two ophthalmology residents uh, did a research project, and they were studying a rare eye disease uh, in immature mice, and so I mean in humans, so they would use some immature mice, and they fed them monosodium glutamate. This is the only picture I could find of an ophthalmologist, so. <laughs> <laughs> I hope there's no ophthalmologist I'm offending of. Uh, so in 1957, Lucas and Newhouse, two ophthalmologists, they did this experiment. And what they found to their surprise was that the monosodium glutamate totally destroyed all the nerve cells in the retina of the eye, just wiped them out. And so they wrote up their project, put it in a journal, but it was a rather obscure ophthalmology journal, so hardly anyone read it. And so it sat there for another 10 years. Uh, until 1968, a neuroscientist came across it while he was doing a project, and he said, well, this would be a good way for me to study the anatomy of the different uh, nerve pathways that go from the eye through the brain. I'll just use this monosodium glutamate to kill the eye cells, and then I can trace it back through the brain. Well, he did that, and what he found out to his surprise was that it not only destroyed the eye cells, but it was destroying critical parts of the brain as well and that uh, the parts of the brain that was being destroyed resemble some uh, destruction we see in things like strokes, uh, things we see with severe hypoglycemia or very low blood sugar, and like uh, we see in diseases like Alzheimer's disease. And so he immediately realized this is something that's quite serious because this is a food ingredient. And he thought, he told me this story, he said, Naively, I thought all I had to do is present the information to food manufacturers and they would take it out. <laughs> and he said, to my surprise, they just totally ignored it. They said, we don't care. It doesn't make any difference. By then, it was a multi-billion dollar business. Um, and it solved their food taste problems. So he went to his congressman and congressman called a congressional hearing and he presented it before a congressional hearing overwhelming, he was a neuropathologist as well as a neuroscientist, he presented his evidence, showed these severe lesions produced in the brain by monosodium glutamate. The food industry was present at the hearing, and particularly those who make baby foods. And uh, they saw the handwriting on the wall. If this reaches the public, we're in deep trouble. So they said, well, we voluntarily will remove monosodium glutamate from baby foods because that's a very sensitive time when the brain is formed. So they voluntarily uh, withdrew MSG. Well, not really. For 10 more years, they continued to add it, but in a disguised name. And the amount they were adding to the baby food was the amount that was being used to destroy these brain cells in these animals. Even today, they add excitotoxins to baby foods, and they created another class of food called toddler foods to, side, to sidestep this restriction they put on themselves. And in toddler foods, if you look at it, you'll see several of these excitotoxins have been added. And it's also added to baby formulas. Now, let's look at uh, what I call the, the big lies of the industry. When all of this starts leaking out, and it was starting to leak out about the dangers of MSG, the industry's reaction was, well, we had our scientists look at it, and uh, we don't see any problem. Their first solution was, well, the doses you used in those experiments were very high doses, and that's not what you're going to see babies eating and children and women. That, that's, you know, that's not the reason. We're using little tiny doses. That was lie number one. Lie number two was, they said, well, even if it does enter the bloodstream and in very high concentrations, the brain has a protective system called the blood-brain barrier that keeps certain toxins from your blood from entering your brain. And it would keep that glutamate out of your brain and wouldn't damage it. And when that didn't work, they went to the third lie, 
they had a research paper that said, well, we, we have studied it and found out that if you eat a lot of carbohydrates and sugar, it inhibits this toxicity and doesn't occur, so that protects you. And most people eat meals that have carbohydrates in it, so there's, it's really no problem. Well, let's look at lie number one. Lie number one saying that these, these little small quantities. But what we'll see later on is that humans are more sensitive to the toxicity of MSG than any experimental animal. We're five times more sensitive than the next most sensitive life form, the mouse. Five times more sensitive. We're 20 times more sensitive than a rhesus monkey. Um, this is a study that was done by the FASF organization. That's the Federation of American Societies of Experimental Biology. They did an ex uh, a review of all the things that had been written about MSG. And they were going to have a, a final s conclusion about the safety of MSG. The study was conducted and paid for by the FDA. And it had an executive summary in the, fir in the front part of it that if you read it, you would think they never saw the actual paper itself. So there's no relationship between their executive summary by the FDA and what the paper actually said. The paper reads almost like my book. Um, but that's what the media read. In, this, in the bulk of the paper, this was their conclusion about infant formula, was that the amount of monosodium glutamate compound, which they call uh, casein hydrosylates is a new trick name they use. Regularly, these babies are regularly consuming large quantities of glutamate in your, in your children. Now let's look at line number two. It doesn't penetrate the brain because the brain is protected by this blood-brain barrier. Well, we know that in the human brain, even in an adult, there are certain areas of the brain in which there's no blood-brain barrier. For instance, if we look at the pituitary gland, the posterior pituitary gland, and uh, lining inside, I'm a beam stuff. Uh, always carries there. There are certain critical areas of the brain that have no barrier. So anything that's in your blood is going to go into your brain in those areas. These are very critical zones of the brain. So that shows that that part's a lie. And we know that uh, even if you have a normal intact part of your brain with a normal blood-brain barrier, if you have a high level of glutamate in your blood, over time, it'll penetrate even the normal blood-brain barrier. And third, we know that there are frequent causes in which the blood-brain barrier is disrupted. These aren't rare conditions, strokes. That's not rare. Think how many tens of millions of people in the United States are walking around who have had a stroke. Many don't even know they've had a stroke. We call them mini-strokes. They occur in silent areas of the brain. It opens up the blood-brain barrier. Whatever's in your food is going to go through there. Head injury. Millions of people have had head injuries. Hypertension, how many people in this country has high blood pressure? It'll open the blood-brain barrier. Diabetes, a common condition. If you've ever had brain surgery, if you've ever had a heat stroke, when you have a high fever, it opens your blood-brain barrier. Certain drugs uh, that people take uh, for different conditions will open the blood-brain barrier. Multiple sclerosis is a common disease in which the blood-brain barrier is open. That's what happens. Every time they have this onset of symptoms, the blood-brain barrier is opening up, and that's why they have the symptoms. So if they're consuming food with a lot of MSG in it or NutraSweet or other excitotoxins, it goes through these openings in the MS plaques in the brain, and they get a lot worse. And what we find in the MS patients is if they consume a food with MSG, they will get worse for days or weeks afterwards. It's a prolonged worsening. Every time they consume it, they get worse again. They go to their doctor, their doctor says, oh, that's just the natural course of the disease. It's not the natural course of the disease in these instances. They're poisoning themselves. Severe hypoglycemia, if you have low blood sugar, it'll open up your blood-brain barrier. So if, you have, if you're a diabetic, and hypoglycemia is common in diabetics who are 
using the insulin, their blood sugar will fall real low. That opens the blood-brain barrier. If they're doing what most doctors in this country tell them to do and use NutraSweet, when they open their blood-brain barrier during one of these spells, it's being flooded by toxins. If you've had a radiation, in other words, if you get x-ray treatments to your head, it opens up your blood-brain barrier. And if you have infections in that area, it'll open up the blood-brain barrier. So we see uh, that these big lies, so far we've wiped out number one and number two. Now let's look at number three, that carbohydrates and other food products will block excitotoxicity. Um, what they have found with this is that there was an experiment done by a person who does a lot of defending of MSG, saying it's safe. And he did an experiment on animals in which he fed them carbohydrates, and his conclusion in the paper was the carbohydrates blocked the toxicity. Well, I got his paper and I read it, and that's not what the paper said at all. What the paper found was that if you take high concentrations of sugar or uh, uh, refined carbohydrates, you will reduce the toxicity, but it still causes brain damage. Now, I was interested just how much carbohydrate or sugar does it take to give any protection? Well, according to his paper, it would take about 10 to 15 packs of sugar these little packets of sugar. You'd have to eat that every time you ate a meal to get any protection. And in his own paper, anything less than that offered no protection. Or you'd have to eat 17 soda crackers every time you ate a meal that had MSG in it to get any protection. So that argument kind of fell to the wayside. So we see there are three big lies have just gone by the wayside, but they never give up. They come up with another one. Now, these are the, diag the uh, uh, disguised names of MSG. Once they found out we were hot on the trail, they said, well, our own alternative is to change the name so the public doesn't recognize it. And this is just a partial list of the names that they have come up with. Uh, frequent one is hydrolyzed vegetable protein. You see that in many, many foods, a lot of soups. You'll see it sold at health food stores. Uh, when you hydrolyze a protein, what you do is you break it down and you release its amino acids. One of the higher concentrated amino acids is glutamate. Another one is aspartate, which is also an excitotoxin. L-cysteine is an excitotoxin. Glycine magnifies excitotoxicity. And these amino acids are released and highly concentrated in these different protein products. So if you get textured protein, vegetable, uh, protein, hydrolyzed plant protein, there are all kinds of disguised names, whey protein, enzymes, uh, spices, natural flavoring is a common name they use, uh, carrageenan is one of the newer ones, it's a uh, highly